I am very pleased to introduce Emily Labor Warren, Director of the Health and Science Reporting Program at Newmark J School. Emily, welcome. Hi, thanks so much. And excuse the noise in the background. I thought I had worked that out, but apparently not, but it will end soon. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, panel. And I wanna first just start by introducing Alex and Rachel. So Alex Robinson lives in Ottawa, Canada. He's the editor of Modern Farmer. Um, the magazine covers small farms, gardening, food, and cooking, and is an aspirational read for folks in Brooklyn and other er er urban areas who dream about living close to the land. Alex graduated from Newmark CUNY J School in 2012, where he did the urban concentration. Since graduating, he's worked in newsrooms across North America. In recent years, he covered Canadian legal affairs for Thomson Reuters in Toronto and worked as a reporter for 1310 News, a radio station in Ottawa. About a year ago, he landed at Modern Farmer, whose editorial offices are in Ottawa. Um, so that's Alex. Now, Rachel Sapin is a business reporter at Interfish Media, a trade magazine directed at people who work in the seafood industry, from the people who catch or farm the fish to those who process, market, and sell it. Rachel covers the species of fish that Americans most like to eat, which are salmon, shrimp, and pollock, which is the ingredient in many fish sticks. Originally from Colorado, Rachel lives in Everett, Washington, which is outside Seattle and near the editorial offices in the U.S. of Intrafish, a Norwegian company. Uh, before studying journalism, Rachel worked for a nonprofit that helped high school students find internship and volunteer opportunities. Like Alex, she was in the class of 2012 at Newmark CUNY J. She focused on audio and did the urban reporting concentration as well. Um, she moved to uh, Interfish Media two years ago after working at the Aurora Sentinel and a business journal in Albuquerque. So here's one little fun fact. Alex and Rachel did become friends during their time at CUNY and recently when two of their mutual friends got married in Brooklyn, Rachel was the maid of honor and Alex was the best man. Another fun fact, the friends who got married were also CUNY 2012 alums. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with Alex. Um, so the first question I have for you is just how has the COVID epidemic changed the way Modern Farmer is approaching its coverage of food and farming? Like what sorts of stories are you finding that people want to read? Yeah, so I mean, ever since the stay at home orders um, were implemented, we've been seeing insane traffic on um, certain types of stories. Um, in the past, we've written a lot of how-tos um, that explain how um, how to grow your own food, um, how to start your own um, kitchen coop, uh, chicken coop in your backyard, things like that. And so we saw a lot of traffic on um, those kinds of stories as um, as people started to um, think about or and get worried about their about the food supply early on. Um, and so we've continued focusing on those kinds of stories. Um, we wrote one pretty early on about uh, jump-starting your own victory gardens inexpensively and quickly. Um, people were also seemed very worried about whether they can get the disease from food. Um, and um, so, and there was a lot of misinformation going around on the internet about whether you needed to leave your groceries outside on your porch for three days before you bring them in or um, whether you needed to um, sa sanitize everything. And so we, we, we ran a few Q and A's with so, some experts that we felt like they needed to, to hear from like a, a food microbiologist just to dispel some of that. And those did very well. Um, and other stories that have done very well is just kind of generally our news coverage um, of kind of the breakdowns in the food supply chain, farm workers not being able to get into country um, and stories about how all this has affected farmers. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Rachel, I'm going to ask you the same thing. So what kinds of stories has Intrafish been running during the pandemic? Um, yeah, so we're a trade publication. So we're really focused on providing information to businesses, specifically seafood businesses. So we've really focused on what does this mean for the food supply chain from what it means for seafood producers to food service to distributors to retail and just the changing dynamics of that on a daily basis since I was looking back at our coverage and for us, it really started hitting our news um, in about mid January was really when uh, coronavirus really started to impact um, the seafood industry. Um, okay, great. Um, so 
I wanted to start with sort of like the consumer experience. So right before, like sometime in March, it seems like people in the U.S. started hoarding food. And many Americans had the strange experience of going to the grocery store and finding the shelves were empty, maybe for the first time, you know, in their lives. So at that point, there was a lot of reporting saying, don't worry, the food supply chain is strong. You know, as long as everyone just stops panic shopping, everything's going to go back to normal. But then more recently, We've seen these shutdowns at meat processing plants because of workers falling ill, and we're seeing that meat shortages seem possible, um, and there have been some temporary plant closures. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, first of all, like, what is the food supply chain, and what makes it either strong or vulnerable? Um, Alex, do you want to start with that? Sure. So the food supply chain in a nutshell is the process of how your food goes from a seed in the ground to the food on your plate. Um, and in terms of whether a uh, food supply chain is strong or vulnerable, um, every, for, a strong, for a food supply chain to be strong, every link in the chain needs to work together. Um, and when it comes to the meat supply, supply chain in the U.S., it's very reliant on a, on a limited number of regional plants run by a handful of large food companies. And those, com those, those limited number of plants do like a huge majority of, of the processing of meat. And it's a very efficient and very fine-tuned machine without a lot of slack. So when one or when 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 few when just a few of those plants close down it can have very significant impacts for for farmers and consumers so before i get to rachel so are you saying that more diversity in the supply chain actually makes it stronger more resilient right or at least more localized processing and and not as much of a dependence or reliance on just a just a, a few hundred meat processing plants Okay. All right. Um, so Rachel, how about for seafood, you know, and I know it's more of a global business. Can you talk to us about it, the food supply chain? Yeah. So it's, it's similar to what Alex was mentioning. You just substitute fish for seeds. That's your uh, raw material you're working with. And then you have producers, um, which in my profession are um, fishing vessels and uh, companies. And those producers uh, provide product to primary processors, which is kind of the equivalent of um, the meat processing uh, factories you see in the US. And then these processors then work with distributors like major companies such as Cisco to provide um, product to, to food, food service, which is everything from like food you eat on cruise ships to um, food that's delivered to institutions and schools and restaurants or it's delivered to retail, um, which is your grocery store, or your gas station. And obviously food service is just what has taken a total nosedive with all of this. We've totally upended our food service and it's what's kind of create, creating the most, I think one of the biggest stresses on the system um, in the US in addition to just um, what's happening to processing workers. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the two big issues with our food supply chain right now. Um, at this moment. It changes like for us, I feel like it changes daily. I don't know if it feels like that for you, Alex, but I feel like every day I'm, I'm checking on like the same story to make sure like, okay, is this plant still closed? Is this um, company still in business? Um, that's just how dynamic the situation is right now. So it sounds like you're describing that it actually, the food supply chain is, is, it has a lot of vulnerabilities potentially at many different points. And we just, there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen from day to day, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I, we, it's not like a, I don't think it's a running out of food issue. It's just what, um, what food is actually making it through this kind of evolving system. Um, you know, so it's like we are getting, you know, potentially now more toilet paper than we used to, to make up for, um, you know, to make up for what people were over purchasing in April and March, but because of that, those same companies might not be focusing on producing other products um, that we need. So it's just a, it's very interesting um, evolving situation. And, and for seafood, it's interesting because seafood is largely imported. So um, it's a very different situation than meat. Um, I assume, I don't know as much about like meat processing, but seafood is about 85% imported. So it's a, it's more of a global supply chain there. And Oddly, it seems like it actually has been less impacted than the U.S. supply chain, um, which is a whole other issue I know we want to get into a little later. 
Well, let me um, let me ask about sort of what we're learning about. Um, let's start with the the meat workers um, and the whole meat system, since that's the thing that seems to be most right now most in peril. Um, Alice, can you just talk to us a little bit about like what happens when a meat plant closes? What happens to the animals? You know, what what why can't they? You know, how much uh, flexibility is there in the system, and what happens? Um, so there isn't a lot of flexibility in the system um, because it's purely because of the reason that it's so streamlined. Um, there are more than 2 million pigs processed every week um, through these meat processing plants. So if I think I read that it's so if 20% of these plants are idle for a week, that means that 400,000 animals are going to be backlogged. Um, and while fat farmers don't want to have to euthanize these animals, um, it's 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 hard to uh, they can't just keep them or, or 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 because there's just simply just not enough room. Um, so there's guys there's that, so the difference of a few days can make a huge difference because we've bred these animals to grow so fast, and <coughs> if, can, if pigs get above a, a certain weight, even by a few pounds, they'll be too heavy to process um, in these uh, plants. Um, and so farmers are having to make the hard decision to, to euthanize them um, because A, they don't have space and B, it's also expensive for them to, uh, to keep feeding them. So basically we're seeing like hundreds of thousands of animals are being killed, but not like euthanized and like kind of thrown away essentially because of these breakdowns, because this, the system is just so finely tuned that any kind of closure, it's like there's no, it's like they're supposed to be moving through very, very quickly. And so if that stops, there's no place for them to be. That's really interesting. Um, any other areas like that? We have heard about like uh, milk being dumped and other kinds of waste that people don't necessarily understand because they're like, well, why can't they just, you know, give it to the people who need it? Um, do either of you have any examples of other beyond meat, like other kinds of waste that happens because of how the chain works? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I, I think, you know, obviously people that largely provided product to food service are seeing the biggest um, issues with waste right now because they're trying to transfer that to retail. Um, but it depends if the product is fresh or frozen. Um, right now we have frozen seafood counters and uh, just frozen food counters, uh, or sorry, fresh seafood counters are closed um, around the U.S. because people don't want to be getting food from someone handling their meat, cutting their meat, you know, it's just people want kind of a security when they're purchasing food at the grocery store and they're finding that more so and finding something already frozen or already packaged. Um, and so right now, I think the biggest waste is probably coming from our fresh sector and food, obviously, because, you know, it's, it's hard to distribute that um, and people don't necessarily want to purchase it when it's at the grocery store. At least that's what I'm hearing from uh, companies I speak with. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that seems really interesting about fish is um, you told me before, Rachel, that um, people tend to consume fish at restaurants or hotels. Like it hasn't been that much of a thing that people eat at home and that there might be actually some really good news here for consumers right now as the suppliers kind of pivot and try and figure out what to do now that these restaurants and hotels aren't buying their fish. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff that's happening with fish and consumers? Yeah, it's it's fun in a way. I mean, it's it's very challenging for these companies because they're saying, okay, we used to distribute to all these restaurants and now it's like we have to distribute to retail and consumers. And one company I spoke with that was very interested in making this change quickly, they're called True World Foods. They're actually one of the largest U.S. Uh, sushi distributors. So if you've eaten at basically any sushi restaurant in the US, you've probably eaten fish they've supplied. And um, they also supply restaurants with knives, with seaweed. They are now trying to kind of reconfigure their whole business business model for consumers. And they're doing some test markets in, I think at this point, Atlanta, Georgia. And they are actually offering anything they would offer to a sushi restaurant, to a, a higher end sushi restaurant, to a consumer in the form of a meal kit. So um, the president of that company said, you know, we've never thought of doing this before, but uh, we have the trucks to do it. Uh, we have interested customers. And I think that people are ready for like a home adventure, home cooking adventure. And with, you know, the lockdown at this point in the US, uh, 
be kind of varied and, and people not wanting to go to restaurants, even if they do open up, I, I think it's an interesting idea. And I think uh, more companies are looking into that type of business model. So the idea is normally people don't make their own sushi. They don't eat sushi at home unless it's like takeout from a restaurant. But now we're going to try and change that. And we're going to try to get all of this like amazingly fresh, great fish to people's homes. So that's kind of a whole new business model that's come out of this. Alex, is anything like jog you when you hear about that in terms of, you know, other kinds of foods or you see like some kind of shift happening because of the pandemic? Um, yeah, I think that uh, with meat, the I think that the, the large com meat processing companies are um, having to pivot to produce more cuts that are that would be consumed at home rather than at restaurants or at schools um, or in the rest of the hospitality industry um, um, is, the, is one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what about, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people are feeling, you know, somewhat just nervous, like, you know, what does the next few months or maybe the next couple of years sort of portend in terms of food? I mean, what do you see in terms of big picture, um, you know, how, how bad could these breakdowns in the food supply chain get, you know, like, are we thinking that food might start to be really expensive in general, or it's just going to be certain kinds of foods? I know it's hard to predict, but what would you say? Alex, you want to start this one? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't, I don't know what's going to happen months down the line, but uh, from what we know now, I think it's likely that beef and pork will be affected um, and certain cuts might be less available. So you might not be able to get your prime rib for your Sunday dinner um, and they might be a little bit more expensive. Um, but I think that most most other foods, I'm not sure about seafood, I don't know much about seafood, but most most foods where the packaging and processing of them involves more automation than with meat, um, will probably be more available um and I'm, I'm not, and something that might be further down the line um is things that we import we export a lot more than we import um i think 11 percent of um, the u.s's food is imported um so things like bananas and grapes might become uh less available if we do if other countries the other countries where we import those things from have food pro food issues of their own but i mean we're not seeing that yet at all so um that's just uh that's just something that potentially could happen that, that some countries might stop exporting to us if they want to they need to keep the food for themselves right um what about you talked about how you've been covering agricultural workers issues with visas you know i mean so this is like moving away from meat but more towards produce um what are you seeing now and are there any like areas of concern um, a big area of concern is probably um, whether we have enough foreign temporary workers um, to um, harvest, plant, harvest, process all of the um, all of the crops that uh, that are being um, being planted. And I don't know, I, I it's not clear to me yet whether we have gotten them all into the country. Well, we well, I mean I don't think we have. Um, the Trump administration closed down the um, embassies and consulates in. Uh, in Mexico at the beginning of um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, which and, and then shut off all of the visa, the visa um, which shut down all of the visa um, applications for that country uh, temporarily, um, which meant that ninety percent of our temporary foreign workers come from Mexico and they couldn't get into the country. The State Department has since said that they're allowing um, those workers to apply um, and not have to go in for an in-person interview. Um, but we still don't know exactly how many of those of the of the workers that would have applied normally just are deciding just to stay home and not come into the country. Um, um, but that's definitely something that we're keeping an eye on. Okay. Um, so these agricultural workers, if they're issues, are these problems that might not even be seen in the supermarket for like nine months a year? I mean, we're talking about because it's about planting and harvesting and all those things. Right. I mean, the, the grains we're, we're consuming today were um, harvested months ago, so we might not see the, the, um, the shortfalls from, from those or the, the disruptions from those things for, for months from now. Uh, but that being said, we do have a very, we, we grow a ton of food um, and export a ton of that normally. So um, 
I, I, I don't know if there will be actually be much, much in the way of dis disruption for the average consumer in, in that way. Okay. Um, Irina, do you have any questions from people in the audience that you want to share? Um, I have a couple of questions to pose. Um, it, you said that we don't we produce so much food that we're probably not going to face too many shortages. But what about regional shortages? Transportation is obviously one of the legs of this um, supply chain. And are you seeing that regionally there are pockets of the country, New York City, for example, where certain types of um, food and fish are not making it there? Um, I don't think that those problems are too severe uh, based because luckily New York City is not a regional food hub um, and so some of the cities that have been hit hardest by this are not food hubs and so we're actually able to distribute food uh, um, to where it needs to go uh, and that's just a matter of luck on, on, on where the where we've been worst hit by the pandemic. And also, early on, you had mentioned that there were a lot of questions about sanitizing food and leaving groceries on your stoop. What is the, what can you tell us about the top tips that you were able to share with consumers about that? Should we be scrubbing our vegetables after we buy them at the grocery store? Should we be sanitizing the bags that we use now that disposable ones are banned? Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, I don't think we need to do much um, different from what we would have probably should have done beforehand. So uh, you should be you should be washing your produce with water. You shouldn't be washing your produce with sanitizer or soap. Um, you should. Um, we don't need to leave our groceries out outdoors outdoors for 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 three days um, because it will probably ruin the food um, and 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 the disease is the foodborne. So you can't get the disease from 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 ingesting food. At least there's no there are no there are no proven cases of that at least to to date. What about the packaging, like the packaged food? Packaging. Um, the outside plastic packaging. I mean, there's all these rumors flying about how. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, out of out of an abundance of caution, when you get your when you get your groceries home, take them out of the package, put them away, wash your hands. Or maybe wash your hands beforehand and put them away and then wash your hands again um, and then discard the packaging or discard the packaging and then wash your hands. Either way, just wash your hands a lot. <laughs> all right. I think that's all the questions for now. Um, okay. what, there's another one. Sorry. Um, how does a regular consumer decide what type of beef or fish to buy? Should we worry, <clears throat> should we worry now that meat is contaminated? Um, I know this has been discussed, but there's still a concern. Um, should we be emptying cereal out of plastic bags? Um, I don't think you necessarily need to do that. Um, in terms of meat, I, um, so what's the question, that, do, we need to, do we need to hoard meat? Was that what was? That what was? Okay, the first part of it is, um, do we need, to, does this regular consumer decide how do you decide what type of fish or beef to buy? Um, and should we worry about contamination at all? Um, no, well, we, we shouldn't worry about contamination because uh, this disease isn't foodborne. Um, and in terms of what types of meat to buy, um, if, you wanna, if you're worried about not having beef or chicken, beef or pork, then you might want to throw a couple extra of a couple extra things in the freezer, but uh, um, otherwise maybe think about uh, learning a few vegetarian recipes and eating some more beans and eggs and tofu. Um, has the environment seen any benefits to less fish and meat production and consumption? Um, are there any practices that can be adopted to help maintain a healthy environment? Maybe Rachel could take that one. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, American uh, protein consumption, it's just seafoods is in such a different world than um, beef and poultry. Like, for example, I was looking at some data that um, NOAA, um, the National Oceanic Administration, puts out. And uh, so, for example, Americans eat 
or an average American eats about 4.6 pounds of shrimp a year. And that's, shrimp is the most consumed American uh, food, seafood for Americans. Um, but compared to beef, it's so low because we consume about uh, 58 pounds of beef per year uh, per, per American. So obviously beef has a huge carbon footprint. I think any way you can diversify your protein source is a good thing, whether that's plant-based for you, um, whether that's seafood, um, you know, salmon and pollock um, have much lower carbon footprints than uh, beef and poultry. Uh, so yeah, and I think, you know, obviously there probably is a environmental impact that we are still getting data about just because we're moving away from a global uh, food consumption process to um, many companies are now looking at what can I do to make my um, supply chain more regional, make my company more regional, just because they are anticipating that these social distancing measure, measures uh, worldwide are going to be around for several years, you know, not just a couple months. Here's a follow up for you, Rachel. Um, what is the consensus about the recent Trump executive order promoting seafood amongst your sources? Is this going to be good for the industry or does it focus too much on ag ag aquaculture and not support our wild fisheries? Yeah, so aquaculture, um, for people who don't know, don't know that means farmed seafood um, versus wild capture seafood. And a lot of the seafood we eat is actually farmed. We don't have enough wild uh, supply usually to uh, sustain uh, consumption globally. And you know, it's a it's a very divisive issue aquaculture, um, particularly still in the U.S. It's, it's a growing industry, but we just we're not super familiar with it as Americans as consumers. Um, but for seafood for um, CEOs that are in aquaculture, it is amazing news. Uh, it's opening up a whole new industry out here. We are looking now at ways that we can bring new technologies such as land-based salmon farming here. We have a couple of those projects happening right now in uh, Maine and California, but uh, you know, having the president sign an order saying, I want more aquaculture, <laughs> I want us to do offshore aquaculture, is, um, it's pretty unprecedented. So um, seafood executives in the US are thrilled. Um, there's also some provisions in there for uh, commercial fishermen as well in terms of kind of reducing regulatory burdens. I won't get too into it, but there's a lot of issues with trade with fishing and uh, kind of illegal fishing and that kind of stuff that the president is broadly at least addressing in that executive order. But um, yeah, it's been pretty unprecedented for seafood and it's very much promoting domestic, local, American-made seafood. Um, as I mentioned before, over 85% of seafood is imported. Um, and actually, much of that seafood is, uh, is caught in the US, um, uh, but it actually goes over to countries such as China to be processed and re-imported. So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what that order actually does for the seafood industry, um, given that Americans just don't seem to want to consume as much seafood <laughs> as uh, other proteins. Emily, so, I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like for the seafood industry, which is sort of a small amount of the protein that Americans consume, this feels like an opportunity in a lot of different ways, and including the new executive order. I just, on that sort of idea of like the, the Trump administration's impact here, I wanted to raise the, uh, the fact that the administration utilized the Defense Production Act recently to keep meat plants open. And I wanted to ask Alex, you know, so what's your take on that? Was that a good choice? And, you know, et cetera. Yeah, um, so, the, so um, at the end of April, I'm, I'm sure we all heard that, that uh, the Trump, Trump signed an executive order um, which um, designates meat processing plants as critical infrastructure um, and essentially um, shields uh, the large companies that run these plants from uh, litigation, uh, from being sued. Um, and so I think that the, the supply chain, supply, the, uh, the food supply chain is uh, very complex. Um, and I think that the people running the federal government have shown that they're not necessarily very interested in understanding things that are complicated or nuanced. 
Um, and so this executive order, um, which compels plants to stay open, um, is a perfect example of that. And it's, it's very much a, a bit of a blunt instrument that doesn't really tackle the underlying problem of, of why these plants were closing, which is how, which is, which is, which is uh, workers were getting sick. And so it doesn't really solve the problem or the question of how do we make these plants safe for workers. It sounds like working conditions in the U.S. at these meatpacking plants are quite terrible compared to seafood, which is doing better, is more global, and it sounds like they've been able to kind of quickly retrofit their plants. Uh, Rachel, you said it's a, you know, to me privately earlier that it's a similar kind of setup processing sea fish as meat, but um, but the, the conditions are much better for workers and it's made it possible to kind of space them and just keep people healthy. Um, Correct. Yeah, I think it's just a different industry in a way that the American seafood companies, you know, they're very much in touch with companies in Norway, um, in Chile, where we get uh, our salmon from, I'm talking about right now, and that these, um, those companies were as early as, I was looking through our archives, as early as around March 11th, they were implementing social distancing measures, they were testing employees, they were turning some of their, um, their factories into labs to help the country with providing, you know, uh, testing and medical equipment. So I think just that really early dedicated response has paid off for those companies. We are seeing outbreaks um, now at uh, companies in the U.S. Um, in seafood. They're not immune to the issue, but I think they did start implementing a lot of social distancing measures very early because they saw um, you know, they were very in touch with what was going on in China and globally. And I think they just kind of maybe, I'm not sure when um, Tyson and other companies started implementing, uh, you know, uh, personal protective gear and, and uh, testing if they do and, and staggered shifts and the plexiglass. But I, it, that really does seem to, to help a company if they can kind of get a process in early before um, an outbreak occurs. Um, let's talk a little bit like about some of the upbeat things. Uh, Rachel, can you talk a little bit about like you talked about there's certain salmon runs that are that happen at certain times of year and if the and, and that there might be these special foods available now to consumers that would normally have been sent to restaurants? Yeah, definitely. Right now it's um, the start of Alaska's salmon season. It's really exciting. Um, so if you can get your hands on anything from the two biggest fisheries are called Bristol Bay and Copper River. Um, those are starting up this month and next. And we have a lot of fishermen that I've spoken with that are saying, I'm getting online, I'm getting on Amazon, and I am getting my fish to consumers because <laughs> it is so good and I don't want it to be wasted. And it's, you know, it's going to be um, a bit of a hit to them in the sense that that's probably going to change the price of what they can sell some of this fish for because sometimes they can sell it for like, you know, hundreds of hundreds of dollars per pound. But um, it's going to be a little different selling to consumers, but they seem willing to do it. And that means we can, you know, get our hands on that amazing product. So yeah, that should be kind of fun. I think if there's an Alaska seafood company you see advertising or you're interested in knowing more about, they would probably be okay selling direct to you. And uh, so far, Alaska has been able to keep its transportation services going. Alaska Airlines has been retro fitting a lot of stuff to, to make sure they have cargo space. Um, and yeah, the state's very heavily preparing to, you know, make sure they can get workers through the season safely. And that's right around now, right? Like June would be the time. Yeah, I think the Copper River, our first like official salmon run um, starts this Friday. So we should be getting some of that fish in by next week and we'll see where it goes. It's going to be very interesting. But yeah, it's, it's delicious. It just I'm biased about it, but I love Copper River Coho. I would advise anyone to try it if you can, if you get it at your grocery store. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to be cool in that sense that, yeah, if you're, you've been like looking at a company and wanting to try their food, but you know that you've only had it at a restaurant, um, who knows, you should contact them and see if they have a direct to consumer model right now, because everything's like experimental and in free fall. And so that is like kind of the interesting upside to all of this. Thanks. Alex, are you seeing anything in terms of like organic farms or local uh, production, you know, anything changing in the same way of like farms making their produce more available locally or, you know, sort of getting a, a kind of like a boost from this yet? 
Yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of small local farms have uh, have moved a lot of their sales online because a lot of the farmers markets are closed. Um, and but they're they've seen huge boosts in CSAs, uh, community supported agriculture. Those those farm boxes you can sign up sign up for that come to your doorstep every couple of weeks in the spring and summer. Um, and so there, there there have been some. Um, some positive things that have that have come out of this like that and people have been yeah farmers have been getting really creative in in, in how they're 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 doing that and uh figuring out ways to c connect directly with consumers okay great um i just want to you know for for those alumni who are listening in um and maybe doing some freelancing i just wanted to ask each of you um you know obviously food is a huge topic um there's lots of potential stories are you seeing anything particularly any areas of coverage that you think are ripe for freelancers to start poking around in? I'll start maybe with you, Rachel. Yeah, I think there's tons of um, data out there that's always so interesting. I mean, you could start with um, who's gonna go bankrupt next? I mean, we're all waiting on Red Lobster to see what happens because every day they're teetering um, and several other major uh, restaurant chains in the U.S. are on the edge of bankruptcy. So I think if there's any way you can get into Pacer or look up court documents, even making uh, Google alerts for company names is kind of a fun one, and you can just kind of follow, and it, it's very easy to do. Um, also, publicly traded companies have annual reports and quarterly reports where they are detailing um, what is going on with them, and you can find fascinating stories just looking at that data, which is... Um, generally on a company's investor relations page. Um, and you can also talk to uh, retail and food service analysts right now. Um, Nielsen is a great one. Uh, you can always get in touch with someone over there and, and they will go through, you know, what are the trends. Um, also, there's a group called the NPD group. That's really interesting. That um, is good to get in touch with for food data. And also, um, one I like to do is just going to the grocery store and seeing what's kind of weird and different and keeping it in the back of my mind, because um, I think that's part of food, right? It's like a social interactive experience, and, and now it's not. And I think that experience we're all having of like the grocery store being kind of one of our few socializing opportunities is fascinating, and I, and I love reading stories um, on that topic. Okay, thanks. Um, Alex, you want any advice? Yeah, um, I think something that'll be interesting to keep an eye on as we go forward is what I was talking about with bananas and grapes and other things that we import and the global supply food chain and seeing to keeping an eye on what is being exported and imported into the country. Um, as I think that 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 is an area where we might see change. Um, another thing is we are always on the lookout for um, we want to, well, I, would, I would like to have more international stories. We've been very focused on what's going on in North America over the last um, couple months. Um, and um, I would love to have some more stories about um, food, so, food, food issues in other countries that already had food sovereignty problems. Um, and to, um, to, to, the, to, so yeah, just a, an outward, more outward stories like that. Right. Okay. More international. Um, yeah. So, I, Irina, do you have anything? I'm just checking in with you again. Any more questions from uh, the audience? Yeah, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. But there is um, there is something related to the freelancing question. Um, someone wrote in that they worked as a they've only worked as a general reporter for a local newspaper. What got you too interested in covering these specific beats on trade levels? On trade levels, okay. Um, I would just, just uh, adjust that. that. Modern Farmer is not a trade magazine. It's really directed at like lay people who are just interested in food and agriculture and stuff. But so maybe, and Rachel, and I, I think it'd be great to talk about trade publications as something that was on my mind as a potential place to work because you know I do health and science, there's a lot of medical trades and they can be like a really great place for journalists to work and they don't necessarily always think about that. So yeah, please, Rachel. Yeah, I kind of, um, you know, it was um, something I was applying to mostly because I was interested in moving to the Pacific Northwest area, <laughs> I have to be honest, but um, I, um, yeah, kind of just applied to it as part of um, applications I was sending at the time to actually more consumer uh, business publications, since that's what I'd been working in when I was in Albuquerque 
for Albuquerque Business First. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, didn't think I would get the job I did applying for Interfish because I had no seafood experience. Um, but luckily, my editor was very open to training me and uh, it probably took me uh, about a year to get a handle on my beat. It takes quite a bit more time than some of the more general uh, news beats just because a lot of the information isn't public. A lot of the companies I cover um, for seafood are not public. So that's a big difference, I think, than other um, jobs. But yeah, it just, uh, it's been very interesting. And uh, it's nice because I feel like the schedule is a little easier for my lifestyle. I have a three-year-old and it's hard sometimes for me to, you know, go to meetings all the time and be on call all the time. And, and for a trade publication, um, it can be a little easier schedule wise, which is one of the things I really appreciated about it. And my, my um, outlet still really lets me do journalism, which is great. It's just a different type of journalism. It's a, it's business to business. So that's, that's really the big difference is you just kind of have to learn to write for a totally different audience. Um, and you have to think about, oh, what is um, the CEO, CEO of this company thinking versus, oh, what is the end user consumer thinking about this product? So yeah, it's, it's, um, I kind of just, you know, kind of just took a chance and, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's worked out, but I think, I think if you want to go into trade reporting, um, you just have to be comfortable making that switch because you're going to have to, uh, change to writing for businesses. If you've been more used to writing for a consumer, which means you have to learn a lot of the weird technical language of the industry and be comfortable writing and, um, communicating with people in that way. Yeah, I would just add, um, so, you know, a trade publication, like in the medical field, it's for doctors typically, not only, but, you know, so there's like cardiologists have their own and, you know, anesthesiologists have their own magazine, et cetera. And um, these jobs tend to pay pretty well. They tend to have, as Rachel was saying, like regular hours. It's like the closest that like a beginning journalist can kind of get to the sort of like, you know, Wall Street experience, not that you're gonna make that much money, but you know what I mean? Like the basic hours and like health benefits and the whole deal. And you can learn so much and just, it, it is journalism. That's the key. Um, as long as, you know, there is the editorial separation there and it, you can learn so much about how an industry works and then you can still go out and work for the Atlantic and the nation or do whatever you want to do, um, either as a freelancer or afterwards. Yeah, and it, it's still very much business reporting, right? Like you're still, you need to learn how to read, um, you know, uh, trying to think of like mergers and acquisitions and annual reports and investor sheets. And, and that can be translated to so many, um, so many types of jobs, I think too. I think it's just really good if you want to be a business journalist. It, it really, you develop very, um, very good skills. I think that can be transferable if you do want to go back to working to a, a larger, broader consumer news site. Alex and Rachel, can't thank you enough for joining us from your various locations. Um, and I thank everyone who joined us in the audience. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's been really fun, like connecting with alumni and, you know, you're all doing such interesting things. So keep at it. Thanks very much for, uh, for organizing, Irina, and uh, thanks, Emily, for putting this together. You bet.